News talks to me it's 13 to 10. During the break, I, um, I found out something else that uh, Dr. Carson has uh, just published a new book. He said, we have, uh, it's called America the Beautiful. Who's we? Myself and my wife. My wife, was, this is the first time I've used her as my co-writer. I've always used a professional co-writer for all my other books. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Basically, it's a book about the things that made America into a great nation in record time and whether we should be willing to toss them out of the window for the sake of political correctness. There's a few books coming along like, like those, like that. Um, I hadn't heard of this. Now I want a copy. Have you done the rounds and, of interviews? Uh, I've done uh, several interviews uh, on, uh, on national television and, uh, and radio back in the States. And uh, so far, getting very, very, very good reviews um, because... You know, basically what's happened is that people have forgotten that, you know, it was a country for, of, and by the people. And uh, as people shrink back from their responsibilities, the void is filled in by government. And now we've got this excessively rapidly growing government uh, that cannot sustain itself unless it requires more and more money. And uh, it's basically destroying the whole concept on, on which the country was founded. Why did you, a uh, 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 world-famous neurosurgeon, get involved with that? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, a lot of people ask that question, and I remind them that five physicians signed the Declaration of Independence, and uh, physicians were involved with the development of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and that uh, it's very reasonable for people who make decisions based on evidence to get involved in social policy rather than just people who are political ideologues. Before I get on to um, onto drugs, I want to recover a little bit. I don't know. Do you get tired of answering these questions? Because I know you get asked I don't. all the time. I've been asked every question on this. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> I know, but many times. You, when when you were doing very poorly at school, bottom of the class, you reckon? Were you really? Yes, I I didn't think that I was very smart, uh, so I was I didn't listen. I told you jokes, tuned, tuned out, shot paper wads, did other kinds of things. I know someone like that. <laughs> um, but you you your mother your mother uh, basically corralled the television, Yes, and you had to read two books a week. We had to read them, too. And back in those days, you had to do what your parents told you. There was no social psychologist running around saying, let the kid express themselves. So, you know, we had to do it. Yeah. And I didn't like it very much in the beginning, but after a while, I began to enjoy it because we were desperately poor, but between the covers of those books, mm. I could go anywhere, I could be anybody, I could do anything. And I began to know things that nobody else knew, and that began to empower me when the teacher would ask a question and I was the only one who knew the answer. And uh, within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom to the top of the class. Right. So speaking of books, let me make reference to one. Two years ago, the city of Copenhagen offered to supply addicts with heroin. Local politicians hoped that the move would keep addicts from committing crimes and frequently uh, frequenting emergency rooms. Junkie heaven? Not quite. Only a small fraction of the city's addicts signed up. The rest program officials said, gave the giveaway program, uh, they found it too regimented. Judging from his self-portrait in Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, Dr. Mark Lewis was once that kind of addict. He was hooked on subterfuge and defiance. He stole drugs, forged prescriptions and trawled black markets for heroin and other mind-altering substances. He was arrested, he overdosed, he betrayed loved ones and he did it again and again until he decided not to. Mr. Lewis's book is the newest addition to a popular genre, the addiction memoir. What distinguishes his entry is that he tells much of his story from the perspective of his brain, a bristling, bustling, neural metropolis, or metropolis, should I say, as he calls it. Mr. Lewis, as it happens, is a developmental neuroscientist. Mm. Explain to us, please, how somebody with such intelligence... Would he be on a similar plane to you, at least at some stage of his career? Sure. Could end up like, well, he came right in the end, but how could he, how could he end up down so far down? Well, consider how complex our brains are. Billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections, remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, can process more than two million bits of information per second. However, the brain also has a, a series of neurochemicals that interact uh, along with your uh, electrophysiological mechanisms to create pleasure. And uh, some of these drugs 
can stimulate your pleasure centers. And uh, to the point where you begin to desire the pleasure more than you do rational thought processing. So it's a relatively easy thing to fall into. Virtually anybody can become addicted. But he, he did, but you didn't. In other words, in, 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 in a, from another perspective, he grew up in a middle-class Toronto um, family and suburb yeah. in the 50s and, and 60s, so like you. Uh, he was an insecure teen, apparently, uh, and all the things that, that, that followed on. And he made a choice. Did, yes, but how much, how much difference did the parents have? Your mother who made you do things, right. his parents, um, apparently they sent him off to an American boarding school where he was bullied by classmates, uh, turned to alcohol, cough medicine and marijuana for relief. He started um, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he, quote, tuned in, turned on and dropped out, and after a year or so in Southeast Asia, floating around opium dens in Calcutta, he was back in Berkeley. So he, he came right in the end, but right. it wasn't until down the track. His parents treated him differently to your mother, who was very Correct. demanding of you. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that God gave us families. Somebody who loves you and has your interest in mind, who tries to create an environment that gives you a good foundation. And so many young people, unfortunately, today do not have that. So they be, everybody's looking for it, and sometimes they look for it in the wrong places, including peers and people who would lead you astray. And uh, I unfortunately find that to be rampant in, in many parts of our society and rail against it and try to speak to the children about it. And we'll speak to a bunch of children about it tomorrow here in New Zealand. A couple more minutes with Dr. Carson after the break. News talks to me at its uh, four and a half to ten. Our last uh, couple of minutes with Dr. Ben Carson. Ever smack your kids? Excuse me? You ever smack your kids? When uh, they were young? When they were very little. I think probably the number of times I smacked them was... Uh, I could count on both fingers, and that's with all three of them. Yeah, but you did. Uh, I think it's very appropriate when they're very young and cannot reason. Uh, a, a, a smack, and I'm talking a smack and not a beating, uh, can be very appropriate for a child who's trying to establish themselves as the authority and doesn't recognize where the real authority lies and doesn't have the mental capacity to engage in intelligent conversation. And I think it's completely wrong for people to to get on their politically correct bandwagon and, and saying you may never smack a child and if you do that that's child abuse that's absolutely ridiculous and that certainly is not what the bible says all of that except the last bit because we don't make reference to biblical matters too much you know? mm -hmm. but all of that up to the uh, a kid that can't reason etc and an appropriate all of that is is the argument that i've i've certainly mounted right through the debate here mm -hmm. so you're pretty smart <laughs> but but we of course have a law here that says you can't smack a kid, and um, it, it's a very PC law, of course, and it's caused all sorts of fractions, and it won't it won't go away. At your age, you've got three three boys, and um, I found out that they all married last year, all three of them. That's correct. At your at your age, you're now about sixty. Yes. What do you want to achieve for the rest of your life in less than sixty seconds? Well, I want to uh, to continue to spread our message uh, throughout the United States and through other parts of the world about the importance of intellectual development and also about the importance of humanitarian qualities. You know, learning how to be nice to people, learning how to, to put other people's concerns in front of your own and to, to live up to the principles of godliness. When was the last time you picked up a scalpel? Uh, last week. I still do about 340 operations a week. I mean, a uh, year. A year. A year. I, <laughs> hope. I hope. But that's way down from what I used to do. A great pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And for enjoy, your, enjoy your stay in the country. Thank you. Dr. Ben Carson's 2 to 10.